Okay, welcome to our last video for this particular website where I will be looking at a, um, uh, a thing called an adaptive radiation or adaptive radiations generally. Before we get to that though, let's have a quick think about what impact the evolution of an adaptation can have on an individual or the population of which it is a part. And this image shows what I think is a super cool example of that. It's an image that's taken from a paper on a thing called the long-term evolution experiment. It's an experiment read, led by a, um, a very talented researcher called, um, I think, Richard Lenski um, in the US. That has been tra tracking the genetic changes in 12 initially identical populations of the asexual E. coli bacterium since the 24th of February, 1988. So this has been going on a really long time, longer I imagine than the majority of you have um, been alive. So that's, you know, we're talking this really epic piece of work. I think it's really cool for that example. It, it's really cool. Um, so every day, 1% of the population um, is transferred to a new petri, petri dish of growth medium. Um, and this is done day in, day out. Every 500 generations, um, these organisms, are, some of these are frozen to create a fossil record of the um, bacterium at all points in this experiment. Um, and that allows, for example, the, um, the scientists running this experiment to assess relative fitness. You can actually just make two strains of bacteria compete against each other and based on the area they, they overtake, is my understanding in a petri dish, um, you can then work out which one is fitter than the other given those environmental conditions. In this experiment, fitness, at least in early generations, is dominated by the appearance of new mutations with large beneficial effects. So each one of these mutations is an adaptation that allows these bacteria to live um, better or to better um, utilize their growth medium in which they're living. Um, then what we will see, what we see is that these um, beneficial mutations allow that particular strain of bacteria to take over the entire experiment to, or for the entire population to suddenly be made up of these, um, these new mutants that have this adaptation. It, that's a thing that's called a selective sweep. The mutation appears, those E. coli with the mutation are fitter, and ultimately they outcomplete the other individuals in the population. And on this diagram, the colors show 42 mutations within the E. coli in one population over the first 20,000 generations of this thing, um, of this experiment. And if you look, you can see a really nice example, I think, of these selective sweep sweeps here. So there's an origin somewhere here, um, around, I guess, 7,000 generations of these green mutants that seem to be doing quite well. We've also got mutations around here of these red ones. So these are two different selective sweeps. And these transiently coexisted before the red one outcompeted the green one. The red has gone on to dominate and drove the green one extinct. So this demonstrates the impact that a beneficial adaptation can have over the course of evolution very well, I think. But note that this is occurring in a single-celled, non-sexual prokaryotic organism. So what impact on evolution can adaptation have in the kind of the sexual organisms that we, uh, we've been kind of talking about for much of this course? Well, that's what brings us to the idea of an adaptive radiation. And adaptive radiations are key features of large-scale evolution. There are events in which a lineage rapidly diversifies, with the newly formed lineages evolving different adaptations to their environment. During a radiation, a clade expands rapidly from an ancestral species into multiple new ones. And this could be driven, for example, through a new and efficient mode of feeding, or the ability to conquer a new habitat, such as the evolution of flight. So if you, if you are the first thing to fly, that was insects, FYI, as we'll be learning in another lecture, um, suddenly you've got this, this ability to then, then expand into all of the niches that a flight allows you to reach. Or, as an alternative, we may be looking at an environmental change that makes resources available, such as new space or new ecological niches in some way, or alters the way that species react. Bear in mind there are other kinds of radiations 
Um, an adaptive one in, is one in which a single lineage diversifies rapidly, driven by adaptation to its environment. But the reason that we focus on this rather than other adaptations within this video, sorry, other ad adaptations, other radiations within this video, is because adaptive radiations are thought to be responsible for much of the diversity on Earth. A really famous example that I want to start with of one of these, that we touched on when talking about niche partitioning as well, so I'm starting to bring in back some of the same examples, because um, I think they're cool, I'm not going to lie to you, was Darwin's finches on the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands. So these species, exactly how many depends on whose taxonomy you follow, have evolved from a common ancestor, and each species has evolved a specialised form of feeding. That's the adaptation right there. Each species is, as a rule, found on all islands in the Galapagos, and on each, it fulfills the same ecological role. It fills the same ecological niche. We also see adaptive radiations, sorry, in the fossil record relatively commonly. So this, these occur in the fossil record, particularly when colonizers repopulate vacated ecosystems after mass extinction events. There is lots of research into radiations and their impacts going on. And I wanted to start by just giving you another example of a radiation before then thinking about how these interact with some of the other things that we've learned about. And this example draws on the really cool Caribbean anolis lizards. This is a group of lizards. That's not even a word. <sighs> Sorry, long day, as you can tell. Um, this is a group of lizards that's widespread in North America. On each of the Greater Antilles Islands, so that's Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica, members of this genus show similar adaptations um, that reflect a different mode of life, right? That's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. So that's, that's a good start. But what these have been studied as a model organism. They've kind of been placed into six categories um, dubbed ecomorphs. So each one of these is a morphology that re like represents a particular um, ecological niche. Um, depending on, for example, where they live in a tree, they could live um, in the crown of the tree, they could live in, on the trunk of the tree, um, they could live um, in on the ground. And what's really nice about this, you've got these six categories, and on closer inspection, each of those ecomorphs are observed to comprise different species on each island. So it's not like the same species um, is spread across each of the islands. Rather, on each island, the Anoles have evolved a consistent set of morphological adaptations independently. These are convergent Anolis adaptive radiation events. Right? So on each island, you've had a common ancestor splitting into an adaptive radiation to specialize in these different mo mo like um, ecomorphs. But these ecomorphs are really similar across the islands because they represent a particular mode of life. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. So this, in turn, has been used to study whether evolution is deterministic or repeatable, in other words, and whether the structure of ecological communities can exhibit stability over macroevolutionary timescales. So do ecologies change over time? Both really important and exciting questions. I'll focus on question number two for this example, and this is a paper cited on this slide here, um, which looks at the second point. It looks at whether macroevolutionary um, timescales um, if we're studying these, whether ecologies change. And it's based on Anolis lizards from the Hispaniolan um, islands. These are from Hispaniola, I should say. So that is Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And it looks at the um, ecomorphs on Hispaniola. So before this paper was published, um, there was a very poor fossil record for um, these lizards on this particular island. However, this paper added 20 fossils to a previously um, count of three. So we had three um, fossil species of uh, Hispaniolan um, anolis before this point, 20 after this paper was used. And the paper used CT scanning um, to describe these new species. So you can see an example of one of these cool little little lizards stuck in amber here and here are some CT scans showing the beautiful detail that was available by CT scanning 
these um, cool little inclusions. The authors of this paper used this to demonstrate that the ecomorphs that we see on the island today actually evolved very early in this adaptive radiation and that the Anolis community structure has been stable ever since their evolution. So the structure of ecological communities can, on the basis of this study, exhibit stability over long time scales. And you can see that because um, the fossils and the fossil ecomorphs are resolved on a phylogeny as members of the same clade as those living representatives on the islands today. So rather than having repeated um, evolution into these ecomorphs, we've just got one radiation with then um, those lineages continuing today. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. And I wanted to finish this video, and indeed this set of videos, and this today's uh, lecture, I guess, as much as it is a lecture, by looking at how adaptive radiations interact with evolutionary rates. Because in macroevolution, everything overlaps with everything else. This makes being certain about things tricky, but it also opens up loads of interesting um, avenues of research. So it's one of those situations where you've got loads of variables you need to think about, but also you can look at how they impact on each other. Let's demonstrate that by thinking about how rates may intersect with adaptive radiations. Before you go on, I would encourage you, if you've got the time, to pause the video and think about whether in an adaptive radiation you would expect evolution to be constant throughout, or you would expect it to start off slow and then get fast, or start off fast and then get slow. What do you think? If so, when the species are diversifying, will you um, be seeing um, the bursts of kind of like changes um, in morphology, say, then? Or will you see um, a gradual shift in morphology um, followed by speciation? It's an interesting question. So have a quick think, and then I will give you a potential answer. So there is a commonly, but not universally held view that in an adaptive radiation, diversification and morphological evolution slow down after initially rapid phase of adaptation to ecological niches. So if you thought maybe that um, fast at the start and then getting slower was a likely pattern to see, that is the current idea that suddenly paleontologists have built over the fossil record. We have early bursts of diversification that occur because niche space becomes uh, it is available, and then that evolution, evolution slows down as that niche space becomes increasingly filled over time. We can think about that both in terms of taxonomic diversity, the number of species that we see, and a thing called the morphological disparity of the fossils that we see in that. So that's the number and the range of different morphologies that we see within the fossil record. So one looks at speciation, say, the number of taxonomic units. The other looks at how different those are. So we can split those out if we so wish. And in an early burst radiation, we would expect rates of evolution and thus disparity, um, the kind of the, the range of morphology and how, it, how um, this becomes, uh, the morphologies become different to be high early on. And there's some, but not all definitions of an early burst radiation that would be accompanied by high rates of speciation. So the reason I'm putting so many modifiers and so many caveats in that is because this is a pattern that seems to be commonplace and it's commonly reported from the fossil record. And I'm going to be giving you two examples of that in just one second. All of the caveats come from the fact that when we look at living groups and we try and understand the origins of those living groups, the pattern isn't anywhere near as clear. If you want to read more on this, or a kind of a caveat to what I'm telling you, this paper by Mark Puttick from 2018 is a lovely piece of work that really kind of narrows in on that, that disconnect between um, fossil data and living groups. So I can highly recommend it if you want to learn more. So my first example of an early based radiation is based on the marine reptiles. So ichthyosaurs, everyone loves ichthyosaurs, right? These are cool creatures that returned to the sea from land during the Mesozoic period. Um, and this is the first study um, that I'm, sorry, I'm reporting, I didn't do this, 
and I'm reporting the first study to look at rates amongst this whole group for the 160 million years of their existence done by uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Ben Moon, and I think Tom Stubbs, and that, that just came out this year at the start of lockdown. It's a really, really gorgeous piece of work. Um, and it uses cladistic data. Um, so that's kind of like the, 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 um, the discrete bits of um, morphology that we code along with skull length uh, to run analyses showing changes in disparity, morphospace, and evolutionary rates in, uh, over the existence of this group. And it shows this archetypal early birth trend driven by ecological opportunity in the Triassic seas. So you can see here the rates of change in both those discrete characters and indeed the rates of change in skull length through time, and they're very much highest in the Triassic. They're shown here, these rates, relative rates of evolution, on a tree of the group, an evolutionary tree of the group. So all of those elevated rates, the, the high rates of evolution early in their history, um, with a rapid diversification in terms of their taxonomy, their morphology, and their ecology, all of those are followed by this um, long period of relatively slower rates of evolution. That deceleration of evolution seems to be particularly strong after a bottleneck that ichthyosaurs went through in the latest Triassic period, so after this time period here. As a, as a whole, we can say that Jurassic and Cretaceous ichthyosaurs, the later ones, were significantly less disparate and evolved less quickly than their Triassic counterparts. So there were fewer variations in morphology and they, they evolved quite slowly. So I think that's a, that's a super cool example. And another really famous example of an adaptive radiation is the mammals. Indeed, it's now argued re kind of relatively um, recently that there are potentially two uh, adaptive radiations in this group. It's a matter of really active research. So I'm gonna say it's definitely um, two, but you can certainly see that on the left-hand side here on this diagram, I've included um, an image from a paper which uses a series of new fossil discoveries to assess morphological diversity in um, early mammals. And this shows, so you've got um, uh, rates shown here on this, this, this part of the diagram here, along with an evolutionary tree with rates um, colored in along the branches. Um, so this shows that mammals experienced high rates of morphological evolution during the early to the middle Jurassic. The origins of those mammals that are alive, alive today seem to lie on the basis of this work um, within that burst of evolution. So that's an example of an adaptive radiation. There were a combination of ecomorphological and taxonomic diversification um, kind of events in this time period. So both in terms of the ecologies and in terms of the species that we see, there was a diversification during this period. The explanations for what may have caused that remain a matter of conjecture. One possibility is that this burst of morphological evolution was tied to the breakup of Pangaea, which began in the early to middle Jurassic. However, um, there is also this second adaptive radiation that has been posited in this group, and it's long been held, um, this is the, the classic view that I'm giving you now, that uh, mammals underwent a radiation after the um, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction uh, as they filled the niches that were vacated by the dinosaurs. So this, this idea is shown on the tree on the right hand side here. And the story here is that placental mammals had originated and split into their major subdivisions in the late Cretaceous, but none of them was larger than a cat. Then during the 10 million years of the Paleocene and the early Eocene, 20 major clades evolved and diversified. And those include the ancestors of all modern mammal orders. The exact timing and the nature of that event and whether it is an accurate portrayal is a topic of very active research. And I put another paper in case you want to read more about it on this slide here that gives you an alternative view. And that's it for me for this macroevolutionary lecture on um, all kinds of things and our particularly our bit on rates. In our Zoom session, I'll answer any questions that you have. Um, and I will quickly talk about a thing called Evo Devo and then how that impacts on our understanding of of evolutionary uh, topics. So I hope it'll be interesting and I'll see you there. See ya. <laughs>